Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Patrick Lee, sitting over here. And uh, I'll start maybe, oh, I see. Your mic is not on. Yeah, that's, that's, but I was told not to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. It's pointing down, I think it's awesome. Yeah, so point it up. Yeah. Okay. I would ask them to what you think about. So I'll begin with maybe uh, some context to tell you uh, that the title sounds a bit uh, technical and down the tree. <laughs> tree. Uh, and uh, the context is uh, uh, probably as general as you can get in a theoretical computer uh, science uh, uh, conference, which is deciding if two functions are equal. Okay, so suppose somebody gives you two functions and you want to know if they're equal, and it's meant to be a non-trivial problem as far as decidability is contained. So I would assume that they have infinite domains, so you can't just run through all possible inputs. And uh, the kind of equality is extensional. So for every, two, for every input, the two outputs are equal. Okay? So this is typically a problem, like I said, if, is there like Turing machines? It's clearly undecidable, but it is actually undecidable almost all the, uh, all the time. And there are very few cases where this can be made decidable. So uh, a, a, an important example is, uh, Suppose that your functions have Boolean inputs, so it's also known as languages. And then you want to know if two languages are equal. And uh, a typical situation where you can decide this if they're uh, regular languages. So yeah, somebody gives you two regular languages. You can test if they're equal by you know, building a product automaton and checking if it, uh, if it, uh, if it has the appropriate properties. But if you go slightly beyond regular languages, it doesn't work anymore. So there's very few situations where this can be done. Uh, so for example, if you go to context-free languages, this is, uh, you know, for, for half a century at least, it's been known to be undecidable. An interesting special case is if you take deterministic push-down automata, it's like on the limits of decidability, uh, uh, proved by Senizerg. But basically, uh, if you think about the inputs being strings, words, then regular languages are almost the only thing that you can do. But now, let's make it even harder, despite it being extremely hard at the beginning. Let's consider non-Boolean outputs. So your, I mean, they're functions, they're not sets, okay? And here it is even less known. So even if you stick with automata, uh, then there's almost, there's very few automata models that, 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 that produce, uh, that, that, that make this happen. Uh, they're typically called transducers. So one example where this is known to be decidable is if you have two string-to-string -string functions, which are some transducer model. Transducer is an automaton that produces output. The one that's written here specifically, it's a two-way automaton that walks around the input string and once in a while produces an output letter. And this, uh, if you have two such functions, then you can decide if they're equal, but this is a highly non-trivial result. Well, non-trivial result by today's standards. Okay. And now, let's make it even harder. And let's try to think of a situation where not only the, Booleans are, the outputs are non-Boolean, uh, but they have non-trivial equality. So strings have trivial equality. Just, it's just syntactically the same object. But suppose that your outputs are, say, graphs. Then two graphs are equal if they're isomorphic. Okay? I mean, already testing uh, graph isomorphism is a well-known problem. It's not really connected to, to, to this, this work. I don't want to, uh, uh, to, to fool you about it. But you can now imagine that it's an even more challenging problem. So you want to check that. If for every input, the two output graphs exhibit some isomorphism between them. Now, how could that even be decided? Okay. So what I, in this talk, I'll present some results, which are about trees. But graphs will appear at the end. And the corollary of it is going to be the first known decidability on Earth, uh, which has a non-trivial example of, of, of functions that output graphs, and where the uh, isomorphism is a non-trivial thing to do, and with, yet non nonetheless you can decide if two things are equal. Okay, so that's the context of this talk. So it's about uh, how can you even check if two things are, are, are equal. Uh, so now let's get to what, what's actually being done. I mean, move this mouse a little bit. Uh, okay. And so the main contribution is an example where uh, this, 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 this problem is decidable. And in fact, depending on uh, 
on the representation because the, the class of functions is going to be a very nice class of functions and therefore functions from it can be represented in many different ways depending on the representation. This can be non-elementary or it can be polynomial time. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get there in a moment. This is typical for regular languages. You can represent regular languages in MSO. Things are non-elementary. You can represent them by automata. They become polynomial time. It's your choice. Okay, so... And now I'll get to the, the, the situation that we're in. So I'll just find the kind of objects that we're going to be transforming and then the kind of functions that are used to transform them. So the objects are trees of bounded height. So let me just draw a tree. So here's a tree. <laughs> okay. I guess there's nothing to explain really. Uh, just terminology height is the maximal number of edges in the root 2 leaf path. So I would be interested in trees of bounded height. Okay. And they will be labeled. So the nodes will be labeled. This is non essential, but just will be convenient in some situations. And uh, an important thing, which is actually in the title of the paper, it's uh, it, the trees are unordered, which means you don't have such a thing as a first child. They just have children. So they're graphs in that sense. And in particular, because these trees are unordered, you can see that there is a non-trivial notion of isomorphism, because you can write down, a reorder the siblings, they're the same tree, and that's going to have to be accounted for in the algorithm. So you could imagine that you will produce the same output tree in two different ways, but nevertheless, by reordering it, you get the same thing. So commutativity, as, in, uh, as we had yesterday. <laughs> and, and here's one way to write it, which actually will be uh, uh, related to, to the technical development in, in, in this talk. Uh, you can think of this as a, this type. If you have some bound on the height of the trees, then the set of trees of height at most k with labels from the alphabet sigma, it's like you have a root label, and then you have a multi-set of child subtrees which have smaller height and the same alphabet. Okay? So the multi-sets appear because a tree of height 7 is nothing more than a multi-set nested 7 times. Yeah? Actually, I'd like to maybe remark that the starting point for this research was a, a remark by Marcelo Fiore, uh, who said that uh, we were working previously on ordered objects, and he said, oh, this is too complicated for me, and <laughs> it's clearly pulling my leg, but, uh, and he said, why don't you uh, work with unordered things and uh, uh, multisets, and this seemed to, to turn out to be a fantastic thing, so I'd like to thank uh, Marcelo for that. Okay. So that's the objects. We have trees of bounded height. So multisets of multisets of multisets of multisets, seven times, or eight. Okay? Now, uh, the functions. Uh, these are the polyregular functions in the title, but that's just another name for some, uh, a classical concept called first-order interpretations. Okay? The idea is that this is meant to be the appropriate notion of regularity if you want your outputs to be, is a corresponding thing Regular languages have Boolean outputs if you want to have other trees on output and you want them to be polynomial size and polyregular is what you're going to be working with. Uh, but I'll explain it uh, right now what it is, maybe just by example. Okay? So the idea is to use something called first order interpretations, a classical concept from, from logic. And uh, what I'll do, I'll just give you an example of a first order interpretation and I hope you can figure out what it does. So this particular example is going to be a uh, it's going to be inputting strings and outputting tr uh, trees. Okay, so despite me not using strings in this talk, I, the example will have strings, and it will sort of illustrate to you uh, that, tree, uh, that these trees are, are more powerful than you would think. Okay, so here's the, 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 the function that I care about. The input is lists over a three-letter alphabet, and the output is trees of height at most two over a four-letter alphabet. And here's the function. So the output alphabet is the input alphabet one plus a fresh black letter. Okay? And what it does is it does the following thing. It inputs a string. Okay? And I guess from the picture you should figure it out. It creates a tree where you have a special root, okay, just the black root. And then for every string position you have a, a, a node. These are unordered nodes. Okay? So despite them being ordered on left to right in the picture, they're not really ordered. However, what you do is you recover the order by these fake black grandchildren. So the second node will have, well, zero indexed. Second node will have two children. The third node will have three children. And that way, uh, the order is there. 
So it, it uniquely represents, it's injective. So you, the different strings get different trees. And how would you go, out, go about uh, consistent? <laughs> how, how would you go about defining uh, such a function? Well, you go, you, like, you do a loop or something, yeah? And what you'll find is that in the output tree, you have three kind of nodes. The root, individual, the, on the second level, you will have individual nodes in the input string, and on the second, third level, you will have pairs of nodes. And then, uh, that's how you describe an interpretation. You say that the elements of the output thing are going to be something like this applied to the input elements, and then you need to write formulas which describe the structure of your output elements. So you define the output structure, which in the case of a tree is the notion of a parent and the labels, you need to define it in terms of logic and the logic that's going to be used is first order logic, uh, depending on well, how it happens in the input string. So typically you're going to say a uh, grand ch child, which is, uh, uh, corresponds to a pair of nodes in the input tree, such that the first, first node in the pair is smaller than the second node. That's typical, you can write logical formulas. So that's a uh, first order interpretation. Okay? Uh, so there are uh, functions that input and output structures in the particular case of this uh, talk, although it can be generalized uh, significantly, we're going to be thinking about inputs and outputs being trees of bounded height. Okay? And this is a very classical thing, but you can do a lot. Like, almost any natural syntactic transformation on trees is going to fall in scope of this, uh, of this definition. Okay? So that's the, the, the functions that we care about. One uh, simple observation is that they're closed under composition. This is a classic thing from the 1960s or something about first-order interpretations. Uh, here's a slightly less obvious one, that first-order interpretations are the same thing as monadic second-order logic interpretations. This, why should that be the case? It turns out on the kind of structures that we're dealing with here, first-order logic and monadic second-order logic have the same expressive power. And that's very nice because first-order interpretations are closed under composition, MSO interpretations in general are not, but here they are. Okay? And I have another theorem in the talk, but I think I will not have time to do it, is that you can characterize first-order interpretation as a certain programming language. Okay, <laughs> you have to do that. <laughs> uh, so you have certain types where you uh, have a basic type, then you have products, disjoint union and multisets, you can nest them, and then you have certain functions to operate on them. So maybe a typical one is going to be multiset union. And another typical one is going to be, this is an interesting one, you have a multi-set of things and you want to do a loop over it, and the way it's implemented is that for every element in that multi-set, you take it out and consider the rest. Okay? And then there's like, however many, 20 other functions, and they give you everything you can do uh, here. An interesting thing is that this expressive power of this language will remain the same if you add higher order features to it. If you add lambda and higher order functions, the same language. And then it becomes a pretty nice and powerful programming language to transform such data structures, and it turns out to be equivalent to first order interpretation. And now let me move to the main contribution about decidability. So the main theorem is that the following problem is decidable. You are given two first order interpretations that input and output trees, different heights, different labels, not particularly important, and then you can decide if they're equivalent, which means that for every input tree, the two output trees are isomorphic. Okay, and uh, I'll give you a proof. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, in the first step, you reduce to the case, although in general they're first order interpretations, uh, you can reduce to a case where the formulas are quantifier free. This uses uh, compositionality of logic, and in the second step, you, this can be done. <laughs> uh, you do the following thing. You check if they have the same source code. And if yes, then they're equal. If not, then they're non-equal. Okay, so uh, uh, this is under certain normal form assumptions that you only use quantifier-free formulas, which are types or something. And okay, that's, <laughs> that would require quite a lot of justification, which is the main uh, uh, contribution of the paper. But it turns out that you cannot write, once you have normalized the code sufficiently, into, may turn it into quantifier free, and there's a normal form that's uh, given in the paper. You cannot write the same function in two different ways. And checking if two codes are the same is, is, is a simple algorithm. 
Okay? But this is highly non-trivial. Uh, nevertheless, it works. And I'd like to maybe just finish with, uh, uh, with this. An, an interesting corollary is that if you're into, into graphs, which maybe you're not, uh, then a corollary of this is that you can lift this result uh, to things, uh, a certain classes of graphs, something called graphs of bounded tree depth. This is a well-studied uh, class of graphs. And uh, the trees here are sufficient to talk about 3D compositions and to discuss their isomorphism, uh, which, which well, well, there's no time to discuss that. And therefore, equivalence is decidable for functions which transform graphs of bounded tree width. This is the first non-trivial result about graph transformations that I mentioned initially. Okay? And I think that's uh, all. Maybe what I'd like to just point out that the approaches that we have developed in this paper, they seem to be promising for further work. Uh, and there's a number of open problems in this field. And it looks like they could be useful. But I think I'll stop here. Thank you. All right, questions? Go ahead. Um, thanks for the beautiful talk. Um, so I was wondering, so the main, the, since you've bounded the height, I guess the width is the only um, thing that can go unbounded. Otherwise, I could just check all of them, I guess. So is there, uh, is there some theorem which says that it, there is some computable width such that if I check up to that width, you're equivalent? Is, is, oh, is that the proof? No. <laughs> uh, OK, there's, there, there's a. Uh, there's, an ask, oh, <laughs> there's a nasty answer I could give you, which is uh, a, if equivalence is decidable, that will necessarily be the case. Uh, but uh, that's, it's just a meta theorem. Uh, however, uh, what you're really asking is, is this the way that you do it? And the answer is no. So th um, thanks a lot for the wonderful talk. I was wondering about. I mean, I, I personally, I don't really get a good feel yet about polyregular functions over um, freeze of bounded height. So I know polyregular functions over strings. I guess they are subsumed by these guys, right? But um, no, 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 not really. Okay, but then why are they? Do they have the same kind of names? <laughs> we have regular languages of words and regular languages of trees, and so. So the, the, the letters kind of subsume the have former, fat right? Fat people and fat buses or whatever. It's, uh, <laughs> well, come on. I mean, like, uh, so regular languages over trees? So I think generalize regular languages over strings, right? Uh, that is correct, but trees of bounded height do not generalize strings. Okay. So it's a, there's a more uh, extended answer to that thing. So there's some interesting uh, positive, negative kind of thing. So uh, if you compare strings and trees of bounded height, they're roughly incomparable objects because the strings have a linear order. Trees don't, but trees have other features. And in fact, if you think about it, what's going on here is that uh, trees of, are more general as uh, trees of bounded height are more general as output structures, but less general as input structures. And therefore, this result is uh, incomparable to uh, deciding equivalence for string-to-string -string functions. Uh, we have time for one more question, but could we also have the next speaker setting up? Um, so, also thanks again for the uh, great talk. So, you talked about, uh, uh, one question would be, um, this theorem you give, does this actually entail um, al <laughs> an algorithm which is uh, implementable to actually check this equivalence, um, given some uh, formalization of, uh, in some programming language? Yes, so uh, I, I, once you write the functions in a certain normal form, then the algorithm is just checking if the source mm -hmm. code is the same. Uh, and, uh, may Normalization can also be implemented. Uh, and then I, uh, but I guess there uh, must also be an algorithm to uh, convert these functions into that normal form, yes, right? That, is, uh, that algorithm, uh, if you start out with a general first order formula, it's going to be non-elementary, which is uh, tight. Ah, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, you shouldn't start with that. <laughs> okay, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker again.